Welcome to the show. Good to have you with me here another week. Start off this week with our usual features and later on the show, I have my good friend and law partner, Chris Regan. We'll be talking a little bit about what goes into getting a case ready for trial in the legal realm. We'll also talk a little bit of politics later on. Chris, of course, the former vice chair of the Democratic Party in the state of West Virginia. We'll be talking some local and statewide and also some national politics. But let's first start off with the community champion this week. And this week it is Kathy Brown, Dee Phillips, and their entire crew and their volunteers at Wheeling Health Right for putting on the Chef's Auction again last week. It's something they do every year and it's always a great event. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it this year's event, but our firm is one of the sponsors of that event. And I know that uh, people had a great time there. But it is something that uh, it's a service that provides much needed medical uh, services to those that are needy. And the Chef's Auction is one of their major fundraisers each year that helps uh, go toward those services so that much, uh, much of those services can be provided to those that can't afford them. So they do a great job with that and uh, it's also a really good time. Chefs from around the valley come in, kind of compete for the who's got the best types of food in different areas and uh, different restaurants, etc. And it's always a good time held at West Bank Arena. They did that again last week. So uh, community champion this week is uh, Kathy Brown D. Phillips and their crew at uh, Wheeling Health Right. Next, the quote of the week. Very appropriate, Mother's Day this week, so let's pick one about mothers. And it comes from Rudyard Kipling, a famous writer, poet from uh, England, who actually wrote the Jungle Book uh, for maybe the most popular thing that he's known for. Uh, many of you have maybe seen the more recent movie that Disney put out, but his quote was this, God could not be everywhere and therefore he made mothers. And I think that's a really appropriate quote for this week on Mother's Day because, you know, moms do so much for us you know throughout our lives whether we're young kids and even into our adult lives oftentimes i've been blessed with a very wonderful mother been blessed to have a wife who's a wonderful mother to my children and you know don't know where i'd be with either one without either one of them and so many people could say the same thing about their mothers you know oftentimes i see on facebook or other social media forums when it gets to mother's day or something that you know happy mother's day to the best mother in the world things of that nature and so many people feel so strongly and have such um, great feelings or memories uh, regarding their mother and I think that that's why it's really appropriate this week our quote of the week is about mom so happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and I hope that you have a wonderful day and week ahead next our legal tip this is one that actually came up this week in, in a discussion that I was having with someone and that's that you can't press charges in the criminal sense really the only one that can charge someone with a crime is, is the prosecutor or the prosecuting attorney. A lot of people will say, well, I, you know, they did this to me, but I, I don't want to press charges or I'm going to press charges. Well, you could make the police, you can make the prosecutor's office aware that something happened, but ultimately the decision as to whether to charge someone or not is up to the prosecutor. And maybe if you don't even want that person to be charged, the prosecutor can still take action. Now, with that being said, they will oftentimes take into account the feelings and wishes of the alleged victim. Uh, because obviously they want cooperation from that person. If there's not going to be cooperation, then uh, they may not have a witness that's can, that can you know, cooperate what happened or whatever it may be. Um, but they need to have some type of cooperating people on that end. Sometimes they don't need it uh, to have that from, from a victim. Sometimes there's enough evidence otherwise. But the point being that it's really not up to you, uh, although the prosecutor will sometimes take into account the wishes of, of the victim, as I said, or the victim's family in some instances if it's a, a crime of that nature. So be mindful of that because oftentimes I hear people saying, you know, I want to press charges or I don't want to press charges, really not up to you. So that's our legal tip here this week on the Jamie Bordas Show. We're going to need to take a break. When I come back, I'll have my guest this week with me. That'll be Chris Regan. Stay with us here on the Jamie Bordas Show. Don't forget to do your homework. All right, Mom. Trick or treat. Here you go. Happy Halloween. For your home, for your life, for more than 50 years, De Noon Lumber. Does 
disasters happen, we take care of them all, from cleanup to reconstruction. Tell your insurance provider you prefer Panhandle Cleaning and Restoration, the official restoration company of the Mountaineers. Welcome back to the show. This is my favorite time each week when I have a guest with me. And this week, my guest is my law partner and good friend, Chris Regan. So it's even better than most weeks, Chris. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here, Jamie. I know you've been getting ready for a big trial that's about to take place down in Huntington. So I especially appreciate you being here this week. And uh, you know, a lot of people may not realize all the things that go into getting ready for a trial. And it doesn't just happen overnight. It takes a lot of time to get ready for it. Yeah, you know, when you asked me about that uh, coming in, it reminded me of something Scott Blass, our, our partner, taught me when I was just a very brand new lawyer and getting ready for trial. And I asked him how to do it. And he said, well, you've got a big file for your case. And you need to take each piece of paper out of that file one at a time and look at it. Uh, because in that file, you're going to find all the facts about your case, if you've got a good file, the law about your case, and the research into the specific issues, whether it be a, a fire or an explosion or an ordinary car wreck or a, a medical or a nursing home issue. You've done research on what, what the technical aspects are of the case, uh, and, and so you'll be able to question people only if you know that information. So that's kind of step one. Well, you know, and, and that's one of the things, you know, talking about the, the file, you know, oftentimes, you know, in the cases that we handle, you, you walk into court and your file is not just a, what people think is a folder or a file, but it's, a, it's boxes and boxes and boxes of documents that have been accumulated over maybe two or three years of working on the case to get it ready for that moment of the trial. So more and more, we have some information on our laptops and our iPads and so forth, but we still have big, big files. We've been in and out of courthouses with sometimes 20, 25 boxes um, full of different things that have been accumulated because it takes a couple of years uh, sometimes to develop all the facts and all the information you need to take a case uh, to trial. And so you're going to have all that with you because you never know what the judge or the witness or the jury uh, through a question might bring up and you got to have that information at your fingertips and be prepared. You mentioned, uh, you know, maybe an answer or two ago when we were talking here about that technical knowledge. And, you know, that's one of the things that a lot of folks may not realize is that as the lawyer on a case, if you want to do a great job for your client, you really have to become an expert in the material with respect to that case. So you have to become an orthopedic surgeon, a mechanical engineer, whatever it may be, because how can you question the person that is that thing and know whether they're telling you the truth or not, or be able to appropriately ask them questions about it if you don't understand that topic? Uh, that, that's right. I mean, and that's another reason why you accumulate so much material, because oftentimes uh, an expert or a defendant who uh, works in that area all the time will refer you. They'll say, well, look it up in these rules, or you can check this journal article or this, this research that ex exists out there. Well, I actually do it. I mean, I go to those documents and read them for myself to find out, do they really support what the person is saying? Because you'd be surprised uh, sometimes, especially when someone's in trouble, uh, they'll point you at a document and they don't think you're going to check. Well, we check. Well, you know, the other thing that, that happens too is that there may be one journal that says something and there may be 50 journals that say the exact opposite and they may point you to the one that you know supports them and there's 50 that you know that don't support them so you, you kind of have to not only go to that journal but then say what's out there that's that that contradicts what they're saying and it isn't necessarily the case well that's right and then not only do you have to take all that information even if you've read 50 articles but you have to spend a lot of time thinking about how can you boil that down to something that's going to be presented to the jury for maybe 15 minutes or 30 minutes of one portion of one witness because that meant much may go in to 10 minutes of presentation, you know, hours and hours and hours or weeks and weeks and weeks of preparation go into just something that you're going to say for a very short time. And you want it to be short because the jury can only put up uh, with so much information. It's very difficult to sit there for weeks at a time listening to a trial if the lawyers haven't practiced their presentation in a way to try to keep it interesting. You know, I, I mentioned that your trial that's coming up is in Huntington and, you know, uh, People may not realize you, when you go to trial and you may be in, in Huntington, you may be somewhere in central Pennsylvania, you may be over in Ohio somewhere, you may, may be right here in the valley, you know, but there's also a lot of travel that goes into preparing for these cases because of the expert witnesses that you mentioned earlier. You know, they may be all over the country. You may have an expert in uh, a field of medicine out in, uh, the, maybe it's at Stanford or somewhere out in California. You may have a, an engineer in a case, a different type of case that's down in Texas. So you're traveling all these places for the depositions and things as the case is going on. So a lot of time away from home too. Uh, that's right. I mean, between the defendants and the, and the plaintiffs in, in the upcoming matter, we have experts in Ontario, California, uh, in New York, New York, and then in Tennessee. Uh, 
uh, all coming in uh, from different areas to converge for the trial because uh, everybody selects who they'd like uh, to be those expert witnesses and the defendants may get somebody from one part of the country, you might get somebody from somewhere else uh, because rarely do you have local people uh, wanting to testify against the people who work in the same community uh, that, they, that they live and work in. That's, that's very unusual. So it's often the case that the expert witnesses, particularly in a medical case, will be far flung like that. And one of the things that's, of course, important is not only to, to identify who those experts are, but to try to have the best credentialed people you can have. And uh, that obviously costs money that, you know, you have to fork out in order to pay those people for their time. And if, they're, if they truly are experts, which you try to get, then you know, they're going to be compensated well for their time. Oh, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you know, the, the, the business of, uh, of, of trials involves a lot of people who charge for their services, including the court reporters who are involved, the expert witnesses who might be involved. Sometimes people have consultants or jury consultants that they use. And uh, all of those are highly developed businesses that both plaintiffs and defendants will use in order to present their case in the best light possible. Well, I know that uh, you'll be well prepared for the upcoming trial, like you always are. Uh, have a great track record. You know, you've uh, been named a super lawyer. You know, uh, a, a number of times. I think just recently for the sixth time, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, by that publication uh, for the state of West Virginia. Of course, I've been uh, the West Virginia Association for Justice's member of the year, and have had a lot of other accolades. So. I know you'll continue to do a great job and of course one of your other interests is politics and uh, when we come back after we take a break we'll talk a little bit about some of the political things that are going on both the uh, statewide and national level including uh, we still don't have a budget here in West Virginia so we'll talk about that when we come back from the break. There hasn't been anything going on in politics has there? No I tell you what we do need to take a break stay with us we'll be back in just a moment to talk a little bit about the politics. Welcome back to the show. I've been speaking with my guest this week, my good friend and law partner, Chris Regan. We've been talking a little bit about the legal side of things, but now we're going to turn to another one of Chris's interests, and that's politics. He's the former vice chair of the West Virginia Democratic Party and is frequently blogs uh, about politics and uh, writes uh, editorials that are frequently in the uh, local and statewide newspapers. And Chris, a lot going on in politics. Uh, let's start off with, you know, kind of statewide here, uh, special session called but ends with no budget being passed. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't have a budget, and in, in general terms, the poker game that is West Virginia is several hundred million dollars light when it comes to what's in the pot. We simply don't have the money uh, that we've taken in in tax revenue to fund the normal operations of the government. And that follows on several years when that's been the case. And so Governor Tomlin, our previous governor, has made cuts uh, every year for a number of years into a, a, a great deal of our government services, and now we're still short. Uh, and so a special session was called and then aborted uh, because the Republicans and Democrats in Charleston, uh, the Democrat being the governor, the Republicans controlling the legislature, could not agree on how to fix it. Well, you know, and let's talk a little bit more about that in depth. You know, the, the governor proposed something. The Senate did pass uh, a bill, went to the House, and it was killed almost immediately. I mean, you know, I think first reading and boom and session ends and no budget, no, no further discussion, just that's it. And uh, not gonna reconvene, I guess, until May 15, it sounds like. That's right, I mean, the, uh, the, the Senate did pass it, although some of the senators who voted for it said they only voted for it because they knew it was about to be immediately killed and were trying to get out of there because it, it passed, I think, 32 to one or something, but it's a little misleading because some of them don't really support it. Uh, but in any, in any case, the House said, we're not having anything to do with that. Uh, because this bill contains various revenue measures and new taxes that they are uh, totally unwilling to support. Uh, they say it all has to be accomplished with cuts uh, to services. 
in order to balance the budget. And uh, the governor has said he absolutely can't do it, uh, that it would involve closing colleges and universities, taking money away from our teachers, our public safety personnel. Um, but both the budgets involve something that I think everybody should know about, which is they both tend to reduce income taxes, uh, which are mainly paid by high earners, uh, and substitute sales taxes and charges and usages, which are mainly paid, uh, that tend to shift the burden towards uh, regular people. So both the governor's budget and the Republican budget have that feature of getting away from income taxes and onto what they want to call consumption taxes, but are really just sales taxes. So it's not, from my perspective, neither budget is, is a great one for the average person in West Virginia. We'll continue to keep an eye on that, you know, uh, as the legislature reconvenes in, in a, uh, a number of days now. And, and see what happens there, but also some other statewide news in politics, and that is that uh, U.S. Congressman Evan Jenkins has announced that he is going to run in 2018 for the U.S. Senate seat held by Joe Manchin. Uh, and Senator Manchin, of course, the Democrat incumbent, and Evan Jenkins, the Republican, former Democrat, uh, switched over to the Republican Party uh, several years back before he uh, ran for uh, the, the national office there. And, now he's going to take a run for Joe Manchin's seat. And, uh, you know, I think seeing it as an opportunity because you look and, you know, we've got a uh, Republican senator and now Shelley Moore Capito, you know, three uh, Republicans that are elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. And so he looks and says, hey, let's, let's make it a clean sweep that the time's never been better. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, they, the Republicans are certainly very optimistic uh, that it's been going all their way uh, for four elections in a row. Really, since 2010, the Republicans have had successful elections um, statewide on the whole every year since 2010. So Jenkins comes out with a, a, a big two minute ad that he that he filmed and prepared, basically charging Joe Manchin with being a flip flopper, saying he's a flip flopper on gun control, which, as you mentioned, is quite a charge for Jenkins to bring out because he started his career as a Republican uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Then he flipped to Democrat when Democrats were all we were electing in West Virginia all the way up to 2013. Then 2013, he saw which way the winds were blowing, switched back to Republican, uh, and defeated Congressman Rahal and got himself into Congress that way. So um, whatever he's going to charge Joe Manchin with, flip-flopper is probably not Jenkins' best move, but it was the one he made out of the gate. Well, you know, and of course, the, the, the thing he attempted to do, too, in the ad was it really there wasn't anything substantive about what his plan is. Here's what I'm going to do if I go to Washington. Well, he's already in Washington, but if I am in the Senate, uh, here's, here's my plan. Here's what I've done so far mm -hmm. for you. Nothing about that. It was all, you know, basically, Senator Manchin is a friend of President Obama, he's a friend of Hillary Clinton. Don't vote for him, vote, you know, I'm gonna be running now. Uh, yeah, they had that, they had him saying something good about Obama and Obama saying something good about Manchin. And that's the formula they've been using. And the real question is, now that Obama is gone, how long can you beat that drum? Uh, will it still have the same effect that it's had? Because it was certainly successful uh, in 2016. We saw it in ad after ad. Will that continue to work? Uh, or will people get a little tired of that? Like, you know, you're kind of living in the past here. Yeah, you know, and uh, the other thing I think will be interesting to see is whether or not this trend that I think we've seen, you know, around the country and also uh, particularly here in West Virginia continues with, you know, political outsiders, you know, uh, having a, a prominent role in, in winning races. You know, we saw it at the presidential level with uh, President Trump. We saw it uh, at the statewide level with Governor Justice, you know, no uh, background in politics elected. So you got these people that are saying, I'm not part of the establishment. Of course, Evan Jenkins can't say that. You know, he, he and Joe Manchin have both been around in politics for a long time, but it will also be interesting to see if anyone else on the Republican side throws their hat into the ring besides uh, Congressman Jenkins. Well, interestingly, there is a, a coal miner who had a famous exchange with Hillary Clinton at a town hall, uh, I think in Logan County, last election season, who has declared for the Republican nomination. But, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, with Manchin and Jenkins, you could not get two more career politicians. I mean, they've been running for things and been in elective office. Um, probably for a total of 50 years, maybe 60 years put together. So uh, whether an outsider could come into that race and shake it up, we certainly have seen that uh, be successful with Jim Justice, with Donald Trump in the last cycle uh, here in West Virginia. So uh, I, I would think people will be paying attention to that if somebody else gets in. There's a long way to go, 18 months till this election. Another interesting twist to this story is, of course, that Congressman Jenkins will have to give up his, his U.S. House. So he can't run for both at the same time. So that opens up a spot there, but, you know, two years later, uh, there's going to be redistricting. 
Uh, two years or four years later? I think uh, four, four years. They're so, going to do that sentence, sen uh, census in 2020, so new districts will be available in 20, uh, 2022. So, yeah, so two years after the election, the redistricting, and then it'll take place four years later. But So there will only be two districts likely in West Virginia after the census because we've been continuing to lose population. So will somebody want to jump in? And How much is somebody that's got a, a big upside for their political career going to want to jump into any you know, U.S. congressional seat right now, not knowing how that redistricting is going to go and knowing that it's going to go from three to two and you might be out of spot, you know, so to speak. So that'll be something to keep an eye on as well. Sure. I mean, any, any congressman does not want to be running against another incumbent congressman. But we are going to have, in the game of musical chairs, we are going to have three congressmen running for only two seats very in the very near future. So that will certainly influence people's choices in moving into the third or moving into the first if uh, Congressman McKinley should retire or seek a different office as well. Let's talk a little bit about the national level here. Of course, the big news, you know, President Trump uh, firing uh, FBI Director James Comey, uh, big you know, shake up there and a lot of talk about what's going on there. Yeah, I mean, President Trump has now fired uh, Sally Yates, uh, the uh, acting attorney general, uh, James Comey, the director of the FBI, and the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York, all people with jurisdiction over investigations into Trump, his campaigns, and his close associates. I mean, historically, even a hint of interfering with an investigation that could touch you has been a taboo in American politics. And, and Trump has now crossed that line three times, but I think this time firing Comey has been the biggest shockwave. Um, I mean, that's sort of just breaking news as we're, as we're doing the show. It just came out yesterday. And what the implications of that will be for Republicans continuing to support him, um, trying to take Comey out when he's investigating Trump and saying it's because Comey was mean to Hillary Clinton in the email investigation, uh, that could be the biggest news of the Trump presidency so far. Yeah, and I don't think anybody's going to buy that he was doing this because he was mean to Hillary Clinton. I mean, that's just uh, not something that's probably going to... It's really remarkable, Jamie. I mean, they put out a statement basically saying, look, these things with, with, with when Comey said that Clinton had been very careless were wrong for Comey to do. Trump praised Comey to the skies when he did those things. Um, you know, when he released new information 11 days before the election, Trump was at rallies saying this is the great thing that Comey has done. Now they are saying they have fired him for doing those same things. That's, that's a lot for people to swallow, I think, even who are uh, folks predisposed to support Trump. Well, Chris, I appreciate you being here today. Good luck with the upcoming trial, and uh, you know, we'll have you back on again uh, sometime before too long, I'm sure. Thanks a lot, Jamie. All I'm right. sure there'll be more news. We need to take a break. When we come back, I'll be talking sports. Stay with us here on the Jamie Porter Show. We've obtained the record results in almost every field of law. And other attorneys can't say we've had the largest verdict in this field. We can. We've done these things. We've tried these cases. We've gotten the big results. We've gotten the big verdicts. That sets us apart. I think that says something to insurance companies. It says something to corporations that this is a firm to be reckoned with. It's not the size of the verdict that's so important. It's the change that we hope to bring about. Bordis and Bordis, fighting for justice. Welcome back to the show. It's time to talk sports. Start off here with the OVAC All-Star Game. Moved to Martins Ferry. I talked about this on the show a little bit, uh, maybe a week or two ago, about how Wheeling Island, Island Stadium will not be ready to host the All-Star Game this year due to repairs that have to be made to the structure there. And mentioned that you know this game has been played in Martins Ferry and Steubenville in years past, and I thought it would probably happen at one of those uh, venues again. And uh, those were... Uh, stadiums that were under consideration as well as were St. Clairsville and Brook, but ultimately it was decided to, to host the game at Martins Ferry and new turf going down there uh, right now and we'll be ready for for the game and I, I'm glad to see that Martins Ferry is getting this opportunity. Any of those venues would have been great options, but um, Martins Ferry is a town that takes a lot of pride in its football as do 
uh, the other towns that were mentioned, and, but they haven't had the game there in a while, so this presents a, an opportunity, not one that they were expecting, but I know that uh, Kim Apollini and Coach Bruni and the others will do a great job hosting the game, and it'll be a great event like it always is for the OVAC and for uh, the football players, the cheerleaders, the band, there's so many that go into doing that. And, you know, there's, you go to that game, there are a lot of people there to watch the band. The McDonald's uh, All-Star Band every year puts on a great show, and there are a lot of parents and grandparents there to watch for that reason. So um, I'm sure it'll still be a wonderful event in July uh, for everybody in, in the Valley to be able to, to catch and, and take in and, and go out and support the, uh, the kids that are involved with that event. Turning to professional sports, the NBA playoffs continue to roll on and, you know, the Cavaliers and the Warriors, my prediction to go to the finals, I said that I would take the uh, uh, Warriors to win the NBA finals this year over the Cavs in uh, six games and it looks like they're still on that collision course to meet. Both of them sweeping their first two rounds of the playoffs. You don't see that real often. I mean, you see maybe a, a first round sweep or maybe a second round sweep, but for both teams to sweep both the first and second round, they're clicking all, all cylinders. I mean, the Warriors continue to play without their head coach, Steve Kerr, who's uh, still dealing with the issue of revolving, involving his back and the, the spinal uh, fluid leak that he has from the surgery he had a year and a half ago or two years ago now. Uh, and it caused him all kinds of problems, pain, migraine, headaches, and uh, hopefully he'll get well soon, but uh, he may not be able to return for the playoffs. And in the meantime, Mike Brown, the former coach of the Cavs, is acting as the interim coach for the Warriors. And uh, both teams, again, continuing to roll. So uh, they'll each have one more uh, test ahead with the, their conference finals before they see one another. But I still like uh, my picks for the finals there. The Pittsburgh Pirates uh, continue to, to, to receive some tough news. You know, uh, Starling Marte, you know, missing time because uh, of his suspension. Uh, Jung Ho Gung uh, can't get back into the country because of issues he's had over in his uh, home country. And now, uh, for obviously reasons, are uh, things out of his control, Jameson Talion, you know, will be out for a period of time. Uh, had to have a procedure uh, due to suspected uh, testicular cancer. And uh, so very, very uh, disheartening news. Uh, but the, the biggest thing is hopefully uh, he'll be okay in the long term. Uh, we'll keep him certainly in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, as he uh, uh, recovers uh, from the surgery that he recently had. And speaking of our thoughts and prayers, certainly also go out to Chris Berman, longtime ESPN broadcaster. His wife, Kathy, uh, was killed in a car crash this week. Uh, very sad to see that happen. I, I've had a couple of uh, chance encounters with Chris Berman over the years and uh, said hello to him and a uh, very nice, cordial guy, joking around with everybody around him and uh, hate to see that happen. Of course, she was 67 years old. May she rest in peace. That's all we have time for this week. Thanks for joining in. We'll see you again next week on the Jamie Bordas Show.